my name is Timothy Stuvey, and this project was made under the guidance of Dr. Brian Santon, and it's kind of an outgrowth of a independent study on existentialism, and it turned into this project. And due to my background in film, I was able to answer this question, is existentialism dead? But before I can answer that for you, I need to, to, to define for you what existentialism is. Existentialism is kind of a loose grouping of philosophers, and it's kind of a strange philosophy in the history of philosophy. Um, it's kind of centered around the central tenets rather than a system. And the first tenet would be that existence precedes essence. And this is a kind of a confusing statement at first, but essentially what it means is that you, you are born into the world and you don't have a determined purpose. And this is actually kind of contrary to the majority of philosophers throughout the history of philosophy. So if you look at somebody like Aristotle, you're born with a certain telos, you have a certain purpose. Uh, an existentialist doesn't extend you that. Uh, purpose, you just kind of have to figure it out for yourself. And um, so the second one would be that the individual is radically free. Every decision you make is your own. Uh, the third is that morality must break free of dichotomies and be based on existential responsibility. So you can never reduce things to good and evil or a uh, scapegoat in uh, moral terms. The fourth is that authenticity is the highest ideal. And the fifth is that existential dread or anxiety points to a, ph a phenomenological reality. So. Um, your fear of death actually points to something that's true about reality rather than just being kind of an illusory feeling. So this is the traditionally accepted timeline of existentialism. And in the 19th century, you get the first three kind of big existentialist philosophers who are retroactively identified as such. And they're not in conversation with each other, but they're kind of working in parallel. And then uh, throughout the 1900s to 1920s, you get philosophers who are looking back and grouping these philosophers together and forming a movement. And then throughout the 30s to 50s, you get uh, important figures such as John Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, who are, become major intellectual figures. It gains uh, huge academic importance. And there's also, interestingly, this kind of movement from literature to theater around the 50s as well. And this is commonly accepted in the narrative. But around the 50s is when academics say that existentialism ended. And it's commonly accepted that existentialism is a thing of the past. And around the late 1950s, we get the structuralists, which kind of come and have an interdisciplinary approach that supposedly renders existentialism dead. But the timeline I'm going to propose looks like this. So we have literature down here and then film on the top. And because we're able to accept this jump from literature to theater, I don't see any good reason why we can't make the same sort of jump from theater to film. And this is not some kind of superfluous observation. I think there's some real actual data to back this up. And if this is true, then we can confidently say that existentialism did not die, it just moved to the medium of film. So the big question is, why, aren't, why isn't this recognized as existential philosophy? So first of all, Ingmar Bergman is going to be my thinker who's going to make this transition from theater to film. And Ingmar Bergman was a director working in Sweden. He was highly prolific. He made about a play and a movie a year. So he made about uh, 50 or so movies throughout his career. And he was also raised Lutheran, but he became this kind of like deep agnostic thinker. And he's also considered one of the greatest directors of all time. Um, internationally, he's identified this way. So uh, first I have to prove that really Ingmar Bergman is truly an existentialist. Not just that his movies feel existential, but that he actually kind of identified with the movement. So although the culture movement died out in the 50s, especially once it started to uh, have these kind of political uh, motives that splintered the group. Bergman uh, was actually in conversation with figures like Sartre and Camus. And uh, he said he came into contact with it in the theater. And so this reinforces my thesis of this transition. And uh, once it became political is once he actually distanced himself from it. And so you can kind of see once it became political and not as philosophical, you can see a transition towards film. Uh, we're using film as a medium for philosophy. And there's a direct connection with Camus as well, where they're going to make a film together, which would be you know, perfect evidence that Camus was uh, uh, killed in a car wreck. The medium which Bergman used, of course, was film. And traditionally throughout film theory, if you're going to use philosophy to talk about film, there's an approach of philosophy of film. The same way we have philosophy of science or uh, philosophy of art. Uh, this philosophical approach is actually quite limiting. You can really only look at film and speculate like, oh, what is film, what does it do? How do we perceive film? Or perhaps use uh, philosophy to kind of 
um, deconstruct film. But this recent approach, approach uh, proposed by David Mohol as recently as 2015 is called film as philosophy. So you look at filmmakers themselves as philosophers and medium, um, uh, and the medium as a way to convey philosophy, the same way you'd look at a philosophical novel as a way to convey philosophy. And my question is, well, if we look at uh, Voltaire's Candide and it's, there's universal consensus, consensus that it is a piece of philosophy, not just a novel, why can't we extend the same definition towards film? And th the distinction I make in my paper is that the film must be used for philosophic ends rather than the philosophy used for filmic ends. So David Mulhall is pretty liberal with his definition, and he looks at the Alien series as pieces of philosophy, but I want to be a little bit stricter because I think that would be more helpful for philosophers. And so uh, something like The Matrix that uses philosophy, I don't think really is a piece of philosophy. It's just using it to kind of make the action scenes cooler. I'm going to prove now that Bergman himself had these existentialist ideas. So he's not just using existentialist philosophers, he, ac he actually is taking the ideas and developing them. And as my call, uh, Kierkegaard will act as the uh, primary source for existentialism, and then Bergman will kind of respond to these ideas and develop them on his own. So I have two ideas, or three ideas, to present to you. The first one is this idea of the silence of God. And Kierkegaard defines this in either or as Silence is the divinity's mutual understanding with a single individual. So there's a sense in which the silence of God actually has something to do with your personal relationship with God. And this is something Bergman obsesses over throughout his career. And in his uh, most famous film, The Seventh Seal, there's this dialogue between a knight and death personified. And the knight is kind of confessing his um, metaphysical woes to death. And he says, is it so awfully unthinkable to conceive of God with one's senses? Why should he conceal himself in a fog of half-spoken promises and unseen miracles? And then lower down. I want knowledge, not belief, not supposition, but knowledge. I want God to reach out to me, unveil his face, and speak to me. And then death responds, but he is silent. And the knight says, I cry to him in the darkness, but sometimes it is as if there is no one there. And then death says, perhaps there is no one there. And the knight says, then life is a senseless horror. No man can live with death before his eyes and the knowledge that all is nothing. What Bergman's talking about here is not really the existence of God, but what the silence of God could actually mean to the individual. And this actually reinforces the existentialist position because you know, if God you know, visited us all and just told us what to do, that would be a, a sensualist position. We have this certain telos or end. But for an existentialist, uh, we're not made to fulfill a purpose of God we're just here, and uh, God's going to let us figure out what we're going to do. And so this is actually something that has come up as a concern in analytic philosophy as well, as I cite there. And so the second uh, concept I'm going to talk about is the desire for belief. And this is something Kierkegaard talks about. He says, suppose a man who wishes to acquire faith, let the comedy begin. And he says, uh, he describes the way in which the more you want faith, the harder it is to obtain. Uh, faith is actually kind of something you do, and it's not something you can really want. And so he says, once it becomes probable, and once he is ready to believe it, it has now become precisely impossible to believe it. And again, Bergman responds to this concept. He describes this unshakable desire for belief. And he moves throughout his career uh, with his film Winter Light. Uh, he has a trilogy called the Silence of God trilogy. And the second film, Winter Light, he focuses on uh, the movement from the desire for faith to a need for faith. And the film ends with a haunting scene of a priest uh, who goes to a cathedral and nobody shows up for the service, and yet he decides to perform the service anyways. And so there's a sense in which he doesn't want to have faith, he just needs to do it nonetheless. And Bergman described after making Winter Light that he was done dealing with his religious... Uh, strife at that point. And so parallel to Kierkegaard's very famous idea of the leap of faith, and this is a phrase we use in everyday language, but it essentially means that you can't know everything about your faith before you believe in it, you yet need to take this leap to believe it. Bergman responds with this idea called the meaningful act. And so at the end of the seventh seal, death personified is uh, playing chess with the knight, and the knight is prolonging uh, his death this way and he decides to use his life for one meaningful act. So he distracts death, 
and he saves this young couple with the baby. And so that brings meaning to his existence. And in his other film, Wild Strawberries, made in the same year, uh, it's about a professor who actually needs to recognize that he's led a meaningful life rather than to do something meaningful after he's come to this realization. So he came up with these ideas, and now I, in order to prove that there's this lineage of existentialist thought, I just need to simply show that he's been in conversation with these other thinkers that stretch all the way to today. So the next generation of filmmakers who were influenced by him were Andrei Tarkovsky and Belatar. Tarkovsky was working throughout the 60s and 80s, and he was a contemporary of uh, Bergman, although he died young. And he used a very poetic filmmaking style, similar to Bergman. And he focused a little bit more on subjects of time and metaphysical issues, and also uh, the nature of miracles. And he's working in the USSR, or Russia. And then Belatar is working throughout the 90s uh, on films that are addressing metaphysical issues in Eastern Europe and Hungary. And uh, he's working as the USSR is falling apart. And so you can kind of see this movement from Sweden down south to Eastern Europe. And Belatar influences a whole generation of uh, Asian filmmakers. And so the director of An Elephant Sitting Still, his name is Hubo, he was a literal student of Belatar. And so there's this kind of direct lineage of Bergman, Tarkovsky, Tar, and Hubo. And that film was made in 2019. And I think these issues are especially pertinent in post-socialist China, where you no longer have a prescribed role in society. You actually have to figure it out for yourself. So if this is true, that film is philosophy, then we can recognize the unique significance of this. If we look at film as philosophy, it can help philosophy departments to break out of what I call textual echo chambers. A lot of philosophy has gotten caught up in language itself and has been unable to really address real life lived experience. And if we kind of accept this jump, we don't have to look back at existentialists and, and kind of resurrect the philosophy. We can recognize that this conversation has been happening throughout the 20th century and never ended, and it's still happening today. And they've actually done some work for us, and we just need to talk about it. What could also be interesting is the fact that it has moved eastward, and you have inter interesting interactions such as existentialism interacting with Buddhism. And you can also address modern technological innovations through the lens of existentialism, such as uh, the rise of social media has had a unique effect on how we see ourselves oriented uh, in the modern world and, and the purpose we're supposed to serve. And so existentialism, I claim, is a unique philosophy suited for addressing contemporary issues. And we don't need to resurrect it. It's actually still here with us. We just need to recognize film as a medium for philosophy. And thank you. That was my presentation.